This is the second of two presentations looking at accreditation and long-term care homes in Ontario. In part one, we looked at the results of a statistical analysis of data from 82 long-term care homes in two local health integration network regions, or LINs, in Ontario, Canada, namely the Central and the Toronto Central LIN regions. This presentation, part two, speculates on possible explanations for some of the findings described in part one. Before proceeding further, I would suggest that you pause this presentation and give a few moments consideration to your own assumptions around accreditation. You may have already done this exercise while looking at the first presentation. Would you change anything having watched the first presentation or would your answers still be the same? Based on the premise, accreditation identifies organizations that meet a certain standard of quality, as described in the quotes from the websites of CAF and Accreditation Canada, answer the two questions on the slide. What assumptions can you make about a long-term care home that is accredited and about one that is not accredited? If possible, your answers should be in practical, measurable terms. Pause this presentation now, do this exercise, and then resume once you are done. In the first presentation, I asked the question whether we could expect that, on average, a home with accreditation would have fewer ministry inspections than a home without accreditation, bearing in mind that most inspections in the period 2011 to 2013 were for complaints and critical incidents or follow-up inspections for non-compliance. The statistical analysis of weighted averages showed accredited homes, the rose-coloured bar, in a less favourable light than homes without accreditation, the blue bar. A separate data analysis was conducted for each region. You can see from the juxtaposed graphs that the two profiles are very similar. The weighted average for the 39 accredited long-term care homes in Central Lynn was exactly the same as for the 27 in Toronto Central Lynn region, namely 3.4 inspection reports per year when rounded. The weighted average for the seven homes without accreditation in the Central Lynn was 2.1 as opposed to 1.5 for the nine homes in Toronto Central. Originally, I had only hypothesized no difference between the accredited and non-accredited groups. But the message from the data is that in these two regions and on average, non-accredited homes actually had fewer inspection reports for the period 2011-2013. The statistical reliability of the results was shown to be greater than 99%. So, we now enter into the arena of speculation, opinion and conjecture. I am indebted to a few subject matter experts who have been kind enough to share some of their knowledge, insights and wisdom with me. When I visited a non-accredited long-term care home with very few inspection reports on record, the administrator and CEO told me frankly and modestly that she thought one of the reasons for their high position in the rankings was that their home was culturally and language based. There was good rapport between staff on the one hand and residents and families on the other. This meant that potential complaints could be dealt with satisfactorily long before they became complaints. I would not want to suggest that this was the only factor or even the main one for that home. By all accounts, this home is extremely well run and supported by a culture of continuous quality improvement throughout the organization. My guess is that you would find most, if not all, required organizational practices actively in place as a matter of course and organizational culture. With that as a seed, let us juxtapose two scenarios for comparison. In scenario one, we have a long-term care home with low need to obtain accreditation. Good staff, resident relationships resulting in few complaints. 
family members reinforcing to the residents how lucky they are to be in such a well-reputed home, would-be residents lining up at the doors and average wait times of over two years, even with minimal advertising. This is an oversimplification, but you get the idea. In this scenario, the Board of Management considers accreditation and actually decides against obtaining accreditation until such time as the LIN requires it of all homes in the region. It simply does not provide sufficient return on investment or justify the expense. Compare that scenario with a long-term care home plagued by complaints and inspections, high turnover of unhappy staff, and investors or stakeholders asking the board of directors what is going on, or worse, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care breathing fire. In such a scenario, the time between deciding to get accreditation and actually becoming accredited seems to buy some respite from the above pressures, as it immediately gives a story to tell of doing something about the situation. Certainly, it is not too difficult to picture a scenario with a strong driver for accreditation. Fast forward to a scenario immediately after accreditation or re-accreditation and compare the drivers. Imagine that you had 22 critical incident and complaint inspections in the previous year, but in this year of your re-accreditation, you have only had one at the beginning of the year in January. It is now October. Imagine also that you did not merely get re-accredited, but your accreditation was with exemplary standing. I can well imagine a temptation to complacency. As this slide shows, there really is a long-term care home that had 22 critical incident and complaint inspections in 2011, as their accreditation period was coming to an end. That home was re-accredited with exemplary standing in 2012, when they only had three inspections, one in January and two in November. In 2013, they had seven inspections for critical incidents, complaints and follow-up to orders of the inspector. This was in addition to a resident quality inspection. Bear in mind that the overall average number of reports for Toronto Central Lynn Region is 2.9 inspections per year for the period 2011 to 2013. I repeat what I said in the first presentation. I am not trying to trash accreditation. As a quality management consultant, I believe in the value of good standards and processes as necessary for ensuring the best outcomes for residents. I am simply presenting my findings and inviting dialogue in the hope of reducing the rate of avoidable critical incidents and resident complaints. Here is another representation of the same data, but limited to the last two full calendar years, converted to a weighted average that gave twice as much weight to 2013 as to 2012. This included the final reports for 2013. I did a simple ranking of all the homes for the combined LINs, which you can see on the Pareto chart, where each blue line represents the number of reports for each home. The findings were a mixed bag. The best homes are a mixture of accredited and non-accredited homes. Most of the homes with poorest performance are accredited, as the chart states, only one of the 15 homes with five or more inspection reports on weighted average is not accredited. So, in terms of keeping ministry inspections for complaints and critical incidents to the minimum, accreditation only seems to be working well for about half the homes. This entire study forced me to review the logic in my own assumptions. My unconscious and assumed reasoning went like this. Accreditation identifies organizations that meet a standard of quality. This long-term care home is not accredited. 
Therefore, this long-term care home probably does not meet that standard. False logic. Correct reasoning would go along the lines of the following. Accreditation identifies organizations that meet a standard of quality. This long-term care home is not accredited. Therefore, I don't know whether this long-term care home meets that standard of quality. Clearly, some of our assumptions about accreditation are being challenged by this analysis of publicly available data. How should we respond? I would suggest, firstly, clarify fuzzy thinking by identifying dubious or questionable assumptions that some might consider axiomatic. For example, accreditation identifies organizations that meet a standard of quality. This long-term care home is accredited. Therefore, Therefore what? What can I or Jane or John Citizen conclude about this nursing home based simply on the fact that it received accreditation sometime in the last three or four years? What practical conclusions am I justified in making based on the assertion that this home met a certain standard of quality when it was accredited? Am I justified in expecting that it will not have a string of complaints, avoidable critical incidents, and a host of findings of non-compliance. As a John or Jane citizen, I find myself wondering what the premise actually means in practical terms. I understand each word, but what does it really mean in a resident's daily life experience when we say that Accreditation identifies organizations that meet a standard of quality. Was I entitled to expect that this quality to a standard should reflect favorably in ministry inspection reports? Perhaps it should be considered normal to have some findings of non-compliance, especially as we see an increase in resident quality inspections with the increase in inspectors being hired by the ministry. What governs what is normal? The average? The median? Is the normal acceptable, or should there be zero tolerance for non-compliance to the Act and regulations? In some countries, it is considered normal that one has to bribe government officials in order to obtain what is yours by right. Normal is not necessarily acceptable. These are conversations that I would love to be a part of with you. I also have some other ideas of a more practical nature in approaching the issue of deteriorating quality over time. If you found this presentation of interest, I have another that would probably interest you as well where I make some suggestions for consideration moving forward, especially for homes that are struggling with complaints and avoidable critical incidents. My name, phone number and email address are at the bottom of this slide. Please contact me and let's have a discussion. Pause this presentation now if you wish to keep the contact information on the screen.